our chair here at CSIS. I'm really, really pleased to have uh, Dr. Ben Steele, who's going to be joining us in a second. Um, he has written um, a second book. He's written many, several books, but uh, he is the he's a senior fellow and director of international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations in New York. Uh, the book we're going to talk about today is The Marshall Plan, Dawn of the Cold War. And um, you have to, in some ways, I think you need to read this book uh, as a twinned book to his previous book, which was called The Battle of Bretton Woods, John Maynard Keynes, Harry Dexter White, and The Making of a New World Order. They're both fabulous reads. Can I get, yeah, they're both fabulous reads. Ben, come on up. Um, they're both fabulous reads, and um, they are um, very, very well researched, and I think some of the most, I think some shed really important new light on episodes that we all talk about but really don't know as well as I think we ought to know. So I think they're, they're quite important um, episodes. But this book in particular, we're gonna, I'm going to be publishing a, a, an, um, a book review sometime in the next week or so about the Marshall Plan, Dawn of the Cold War. I, we bought, we've got several copies of it, I think. Um, and if, you, if you're nice to Aaron, maybe he'll let you have one. But we, we, I encourage you to buy it retail and get and buy many copies of possible. It's a fabulous, fabulous book. Um, but uh, Dr. Steele, I, we just had a podcast interview. I want to just first ask you, why did you write this book? Why did you write The Marshall Plan, Dawn of the Cold War? I think you have to go back to my previous book, The Battle of Bretton Woods, which was the story uh, about uh, how the IMF, the World Bank, and the international monetary system were created after the um, uh, end of the Second World War. And um, late in the book, the Marshall Plan plays um, uh, a small cameo role. And I suppose I had this um, uh, epiphany at the time that um, what I was writing about really represented a repudiation of what I had been writing about for the past 300 pages. It was a very different world view. Um, uh, um, to put it in short form, um, we were taking a very conscious step away from the uh, FDR, Wendell Wilkie, one world view of what the uh, post-war architecture would look like. That is, we were not going to be marching forward in cooperation with the Soviet Union. Um, and that, in fact, there were going to be two worlds, a free, democratic, capitalist world that we would lead. Um, and there would be a, a communist world that the Soviet Union would would lead, and I thought, well, really, this story needs to be told, in my view, as, as a Cold War story. This is truly the beginning of the, the, the Cold War, thus the subtitle of which I, which I thought was a very clever. I really liked that. And I'm, the, what is the Marshall Plan? What was the Marshall Plan? Okay, and in order to understand where the ideas uh, came from, you have to go back to the immediate post-war years. So in May of 1945, when the fighting ends in Europe, um, Truman's been president for a month now. Um, he has no foreign policy vision. Um, he not only didn't expect to become president, but he had never expected to become vice president. Um, so he has no intention of uh, overthrowing um, uh, FDR's foreign policy architecture. And one thing FDR had um, committed the United States to publicly in, in Tehran in 1943 was withdrawing all US troops from Europe within two years of the end of the fighting. And Truman was determined to go down that path. Um, there were over three million American troops in Europe at the uh, end of World War II. With, we're withdrawing yeah, My grandfather was there, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the, the American public was not going to tolerate, you know, a lengthy occupation of the in, entire uh, continent. Um, but by 1946, it became clear that we had a problem on our hands. Um, and that is that Joseph Stalin was not going to be wholly satisfied with his newly expanded borders and security buffer in Eastern Europe. Um, he began pressing new territorial claims in Turkey and Iran. He refused to withdraw Soviet troops um, that had been based in Iran under treaty during the war. And he only backed down when the United States sent a large military flotilla uh, 
Um, but the, the watershed moment comes in February of 1947 when the British come to the State Department saying we're, we're bankrupt. Uh, we can no longer afford to keep troops in Greece. British troops were protecting the Greek government against communist rebels. It was a civil war in Greece at the time. This set off alarm bells in the State Department. Uh, but by that time, Stalin had already shifted his sights from the Mediterranean to Central Europe and Germany in particular. The, this, the, the Cold War is fundamentally about Germany. Um, and Marshall meets for six weeks with his um, Soviet counterpart, Vyacheslav Molotov, um, and Stalin at the, at the end in, in April to try to hammer out some understanding of um, uh, how we can um, end the occupation in Germany and reunify the country. And they make no progress whatsoever. They have narrow disputes about reparations, narrow but important, uh, but they have one fundamental difference that could never be reconciled. Neither the United States nor the Soviet Union could afford to have uh, a unified Germany as an ally of the other. Um, so uh, Marshall comes home after these six weeks, makes a famous radio address in which he says, the patient is dying while the doctors deliberate. Um, this was code for we, the United States, are now a abandoning the Yalta-Potsdam framework for cooperation with the Soviets. We're going to go our own way. We're going to um, save Western Germany, which is collapsing in yeah, Western paint, Europe paint unilaterally. A picture, paint a picture about how bad it was, it was how bad. dire it was. <laughs> um, the New York Times described um, Europe in the aftermath of the uh, uh, fighting uh, as, quote unquote, the dark continent. It wasn't just the physical destruction, but the, we take it for granted now that you know, when we go out the door here, we can get food that's been supplied by the countryside. We don't even think about whether there's going to be food for us. But um, uh, in Europe, this is completely broken, broken down. Rural areas, even when they, they could grow food, didn't have any reason to grow food for the cities because the cities had nothing to offer in return. Uh, They've been bombed and fought into a, into a third world country status? Co 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 completely. So these states, economic linkages, social linkages had broken down. There was mass retribution all over Europe and, and People in revenge, Italy. People revenge. Revenge. Everybody wanted revenge against uh, collaborators, real, real or imagined. So the, we, we, had, we had total economic breakdown. We had the lawlessness. Um, governments were struggling to reestablish political legitimacy. There were very difficult coalitions in Italy, of course, the communists were. Um, uh, and, uh, and there were a number of instances where the, a number of governments were going to go communist. Well, they it could have gone communist. It, it, Italy and France um, were the two that were of greatest concern to the United States. So economic, social, political systems totally broken. And yes. that's when he says the patient is dying while the doctors delivered. He came to the conclusion after six weeks with Molotov and Stalin Marshall. Yes. Um, that Stalin was uh, actually, it's not just that um, Stalin didn't agree with him about the mechanisms to um, revive Europe, but that Stalin was actually very happy uh, to see um, uh, Western Europe collapse because that would make it more easier for him. He'll never to, get invaded again. If he has a broken Germany, has a broken Western Europe, he'll never get attacked on his Western flank again. Not only that, but that the Communist Party in Italy and, and France in particular could be used as the Soviet fifth, fifth columns. columns. Um, so he, uh, he was uh, a great um, believer great. in the Leninist dictum of the worse the better. Ugh. Horrible. So I think so. The, the the it was also clear that the Soviet policy in the region, so the Czechoslovakia, Bulgaria, Poland, uh, the control of Germany that the Soviets had, it was basically let's just stick a straw in those countries and extract every single thing of value and ship it back to the Soviet Union. Who cares about the, the, the folk? Is that a fair way to describe what, what the policy was? Y yes, although I should emphasize that there were coalition governments of sorts 
in Poland, Hungary, Bulgaria, um, Ro uh, Romania. Um, and uh, they were not independent by any stretch of the imagination. Um, but Stalin kept them on a long leash as long as they didn't challenge uh, Soviet foreign policy prerogatives. The most Im important country um, uh, in Central Europe other than Germany, though, is Czechoslovakia, which is the only one that had a legitimate coalition government. Uh, elected in 1946, two-thirds of the um, cabinet are small d Democrats. Um, and Stalin did give them a, a measure of independence until the Marshall Plan. My grandfather was in Patton's Third Army and was in Czechoslovakia in 45 and 46, and they had to go back, right, as part of the deal, right? Didn't they have to withdraw? American allied forces withdrew in the... Well, this was, this was the great problem that the Americans faced when um, the, the Czechs were, were flirting with participating in martial aid. As you can imagine, the, the, the Democrats in the coalition um, in the Czech government very much wanted to participate in the Marshall Plan. Um, and there's a, there's, a ch there's a section in the book where you talk about this. A lot, yes. And um, they go and talk to Stalin about this, and Stalin has a temper tantrum um, about this, right? So Stalin initially flirts with the possibility of participating in the Marshall Plan himself. Uh, but uh, initially, he instructs Molotov to tell the satellite countries. By the way, satellite is a term that even the Soviets used to okay. describe these countries. Um, to go off to Paris to negotiate with the um, uh, other 16 Marshall countries um, about what the plan would look like, and then they should storm out uh, in protest over the uh, American conditions because this would be a violation of economic sovereignty. The, the Americans were demanding um, economic integration among the participating countries, uh, but the, the, he didn't trust the Czechs. Even though the Czechs said, yeah, yeah, we'll go, we'll go to Paris, we'll raise all these objections, we'll walk out, but Stalin didn't believe him. Um, so he told them, you know, none of you can go to Paris, uh, but he summoned the Czechs to Moscow and read them the, the riot act about their behavior. But they continued, the, the Democrats did, in the, the small to, Democrats and the to Czechs. flirt with the, the, um, uh, with the plan into the um, autumn, and that's when Stalin said enough. And in February 1948, um, he instigates a communist coup, which had an enormous galvanizing effect over the Republican Congress. The U.S. Republican the Congress. The U.S. Republican uh, Congress, which had it was a complete wake grave call. concerns about the idea of a new uh, massive uh, foreign aid plan. But the, um, the Czech coup um, really There was turned. a before and after of the Czech coup. Czech coup was a, a, a major uh, episode because um, many Republicans in Congress then believed that if we did not take immediate firm action, preferably non-military, uh, to uh, support our interests, Stalin would just do the same thing in, in, in Western Europe. So Dr. Steele, what, what would you, we talked earlier, we did a podcast earlier this morning, and the George Marshall's speech in 1947, you described it as specific, quite vague, yeah. at this famous speech at Harvard about what the Marshall Plan was going to be. It, what were the, t why was it vague? And talk about what was the approach the United States took to Europe and the expectations you, the United States had of Europe regarding the Marshall Plan. Right. Um, Marshall's speech is very short. Um, it's uh, only 1,400 words. Um, it's um, not full of high-flown rhetoric. It's nothing like the Truman Doctrine speech that Truman gives in, in March of uh, 1947. Uh, he doesn't mention the Soviet Union by name, although there, are, interestingly enough, there are two indirect references to Soviet obstructionism in the speech, and those are the only times during the speech when there are, he's interrupted by applause. And this is at Harvard, by the way. I found that rather fascinating. It was a simpler time, uh, yes. Dr. Steele. <laughs> it was a simpler um, time. So um, Marshall keeps the speech vague for two reasons. First of all, um, the Americans only have one fundamental, well, two fundamental conditions. First, no communists in the uh, recipient governments. Uh, and second, um, that Europe must integrate economically. Um, that is, it has to use the um, resources that the United States would provide most efficiently. So, for example, each recipient country cannot have its own steel industry. 
that is nonsensical, that is a waste of resources. So Europe needs to look more like the United States. Um, but he understood that this was going to be very controversial, that Europeans were going to say, well, this is a violation of economic sovereignty, and we, we need to be self-sufficient. Um, so he was determined to tell the Europeans, if you want our assistance, um, the plan has to be yours. You have to own it. You have to come to us together with a combined plan that you all have bought into. So in the business, we'd say it's in the, in, in the foreign aid business, you say there's country ownership. Completely. They had to own it. Yeah. And it had to be their idea. You can't co then come back to us a few months later and, and say, you know, our publics don't like the stuff you've in, imposed on us. We had to be able to say, this is your plan that you believed that you could um, uh, get public support for. We will provide this aid fundamentally as a social stabilizer to allow you to engage in these uh, uh, enormous and difficult structural reforms. But the second reason um, is that he doesn't want the United States to get blamed for splitting Europe. Um, so if there's he, failure later, get blamed for a, a, an iron creating an iron curtain. Ah, okay. Um, so he doesn't Europe. say you know you know uh, on this side will be the Marshall countries, on those side will be the the um, uh, Soviet uh, Union and its satellites. Um, cause they can't be part of it. Anybody can be part of it. You just have to, you have to buy into the vision. He, because it had to be Stalin who would reject who this would, magnanimous would say, I'm not gonna, proposal. I'm not going to participate, and none of the satellite countries are going to participate. That's right. So this was, this was Kennan's great idea, so to there's provoke a, Stalin into and, and he is and, he, and they succeed. There's a, that you talk succeed. about in the book that the, the Soviets, in essence, fall into this trap of saying, we're not going to do it. And then they, they rile up communists in Italy and France and say, don't accept this Marshall Plan money. Correct. Wild stuff. I mean, this is stuff, no, I don't remember any of, the, any of this. You have a very interesting, a, after the de facto or sort of the, de, you know, the actual separation of the two parts of Europe, you have, you have a, almost a chapter on the Berlin airlift mm -hmm. because of this. The, the, a lot of this is about the future of Germany. Right, I mean, yeah. isn't this about, this is... Uh, the Cold War is about Germany. Who owns Germany? Who owns Germany? Yeah. So, I got I have, there's several things I need to cover with you, and then I want to open up, because there's a lot of smart people in the audience. So, uh, this, so, you talk about in the book that for 150 years, we, our guiding DNA in foreign policy was to stay away from entangling alliances. Correct. So, our State Department was over at the old executive office building. It was a couple of rabbit warren offices. It was not... A, you know, a, a, you know a, a, a foreign ministry designed for a global power. It was yep. designed for a developing country's foreign ministry, basically. Um, I mean, it re really. And so this was a humongous psychological and cultural leap Huge. for the foreign policy and national security elites in this country to say, we're going to do this Marshall Plan thing. Yeah. So why, so, so just, let's just be clear, all, who is George Marshall? Just because everyone, you know, or when you use that, throws that term around, who was George Marshall? Well, and how, how esteemed was he at the time? Uh, George Marshall was widely considered in the United States the hero of the Second World War. The, the architect of victory in World War II. The architect of, uh, uh, of victory. Um, who, who is the equivalent in modern day times? Is there somebody who's like, we would speak in soft reverential tones about? Who is that person in American, American culture today? I, I can't even, come, I can't come up with somebody who sort of we would talk about in terms of the way people talk about George Marshall at the there time. There is no one. I mean, um, maybe Colin Powell may have been kind of came, you know, was a couple of zip codes away at his, at his high mark, but maybe, maybe, but I mean, this is like, I mean, there's, I, it's hard for us to kind of have a comparable today. Combination of Oprah Winfrey at her high mark and Colin Powell at her high mark, something it's like that. It's not just what he achieved, but the, the way he achieved it, his um, public and private persona. This was not a man who was no ever given to pr promote, promoting himself to highfalutin rhetoric. He made clear he will never run for office. Um, this was truly a dedicated public. So, so this was a military guy, the victor, the architect of military victory. Who goes, pushed out his own friends, by the way, um, in right. the military who he felt were not competent. So, so to goes war. to Harvard and says, um, we're going to have to upend 150 years of ending entangling alliances and I need you to spend a ton of money on foreign aid. 
and we're going to have to rethink our, we have to do this because of communism, we have to do this because the situation is dire, our, our friends and allies, all the, all the blood, sweat, and tears that we fought for in World War II are at risk. And so we have to spend a very large amount of money and put national prestige on the line, not military power, but soft power, to consolidate the gains of our victories. Is that the, basically the, what happened? And the soft power part is absolutely critical. I mean, the, the, the fundamental belief behind the Marshall Plan is that the United States could not be an imperial power like uh, Britain or, or France before it. We could not have colonies abroad or vassals or tributaries. We had to have friends, allies, who would stick with us through thick and thin because we shared their fundamental long-term interests and we shared values with them. Why? Is it because this was some sort of kumbaya moment? No. Absolutely not. These were hard-headed realists who did not want to rely on the military. So although the, you know, the Asia Pacific was not part of the Marshall Plan, we eventually pursued the same thinking with regard to Japan. We kind of had copy-paste with Japan and then Correct. later some other. So, so, we, so the, a, the architect of military victory says, we've got to upend 150 years of, na of na foreign policy received wisdom, and we're going to have to do something very, very radical. Okay. So that means you're going to have to go to the U.S. Congress. So was U.S. Congress excited about saying, oh, let's, let's upend 150 years of received foreign policy wisdom? No. Um, the key figure, as you and I have uh, discussed in the Republican Congress, this is a Republican Congress that is very hostile to the president. To, pro uh, yeah. uh, to Harry Truman, not just because he's a Democrat, but because he's illegitimate. Um, not only should he not be president, but he should never have been vice president. He was the uh, fourth vice president of FDR. Right, kind of. You he know. was a compromise among the the, the party bosses. Um, they had decided they wanted Wallace out, so they had to find somebody else who was was malleable. Um, so they had no respect for him uh, whatsoever. Um, so the one man who is actually absolutely critical to making this work is Arthur Vandenberg. So who is Arthur Vandenberg? Because I maybe you've heard of Art Vandenberg Air Force Base, but most people. I, at least in my generation, I'm dating myself, almost nobody knows who Arthur Vandenberg is today. Who is Arthur Vandenberg? He um, was the Republican chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and that doesn't tell you a fraction of it because it makes it sound like he was a great internationalist. This is a man who was a staunch isolationist in the 1930s, a, a, a supporter of the Neutrality Acts, keep the United States out of those European conflicts, keep the United States out of war. Um, he himself said he had his great epiphany after Pearl Harbor. Um, he said no rational human being could be a, an isolationist after Pearl Harbor, Pearl Harbor because uh, Pearl Harbor made clear that the United States was no longer an uh, island. Protect, it wasn't an island protected by the Atlantic and Pacific Oceans, that um, technology and warfare had changed dramatically. Um, and so he Although he was absolutely adamant with, with Truman that um, uh, he had to be in on this entirely if Truman wanted his protection and his uh, support. He was all in, and he, w he sacrificed his presidential ambition. This is Vandenberg. Uh, Vandenberg. He was offered to be Secretary of State by Truman, and um, he turned it down. It, not quite. Uh, Truman um, was. It was well known that um, Truman, after he was elected, not re-elected, elected for the first time right. in, 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 48. in forty-eight, was was going to reach out to Vandenberg um, to uh, be secretary to be of state. secretary of state. And Vandenberg made clear through Democratic friends that he would not accept it. So let's and just just a calendar in 1948 you had to pass the Marshall Plan through the Congress and you had to pass NATO through the Congress. A April so April 1948 um, yesterday is the 70th anniversary. Wow. Um, uh, the Marshall legislation is passed. By the way, one of the reasons that we really had to I accelerate passage of the Marshall Plan was the Italian elections, which were coming up. Uh, uh, Truman considered absolutely critical canon as well to show the Italians that this is real, um, so that they, they wouldn't support the, the um, uh, communists. Um, Truman is uh, re-elected, elected. Elected. In 48. 
um, is going to reach out to Vandenberg, but Vandenberg says, I have one more important mission to carry out, and I can only carry out in Congress, and that is providing the security element that the Marshall Plan is missing. Is, is, this, is, this the, is he the Lindsey Graham or the Dick Luger <laughs> or the John McCain all combined of his age? Look, uh, something like that. Like a John John McCain, he was a, a, a figure who could stand above partisan politics, but he was a and lot. He, and he did stand more above partisan. He, he gave. He took a bullet for the United States of America. Uh, com Arthur com Vandenberg. Completely. Um, FDR, I should uh, emphasize, had utter disdain for him because he knew that um, Vandenberg was a, a, a potential challenger. Um, uh, he introduced him at one point uh, to a, a, a British uh, a notable um, uh, as Senator Vandenberg. This, he said, this man thinks he's going to replace me, but he's not. <laughs> um, so um, Vandenberg um, sacrifices his presidential ambitions. To deliver, to deliver on Truman's critical program. Yeah. And Marshall said, we shouldn't call it the Marshall Plan. It should be called the... Well, Ma Marshall plan. never uh, Marshall never ref referred to the Marshall Plan as the Marshall Plan. Never ever. Um, he called it by its various technical names, which were, were particularly um, ERP, European Recovery Program. Um, NATO, interestingly enough, um, uh, began being referred to in the State Department in 1949 as the military ERP. So we talk a lot in the business today about the three Ds: defense diplomacy and development. So one of the interesting things about your book is you talk about that the Marshall Plan and NATO are the s two different sides of the same coin. Why do I say that? Because I think that is not something m in my mind, I didn't associate the Marshall Plan and NATO as in absolutely inextricably linked, but you make that point and I buy it and so what, what, is, what do you mean by that the, in the, the book? The first, first thing to emphasize is this it was not the State Department's intent. The State Department's intent was to avoid any sort of uh, military obligations. We're going home. We're sending all three We're million troops home. home. Uh, you know, we'll give you this Marshall Plan stuff. You send us a postcard and tell us how you're doing, but we're out, we're out of the business of, of defending the, Europe. The second part about the postcard, not, not quite right. I mean, George Kennan wanted to make it clear to the Europeans that we, we weren't going home politically or economically, but Kennan, interestingly enough, was against the creation of NATO. Um, he wanted uh, the Europeans to provide for their own defense. He, he, uh, Kennan uh, undergoes a very strange period in 48 and 49 where um, he starts recoiling from his own success as a foreign policy uh, uh, this architect. Is the, he's the architect of containment. He's the architect of containment. He had, in 47, supported um, uh, creating a, a West German state. Now he backs away from that. He wants a unified Germany. He wants some sort of, a, uh, try to find some sort of accommodation with the Soviet Union. He doesn't want an American military uh, entanglement. But he's becoming Mr. Nobody. By, by that time, he's being pushed out. Marshall steps down as Secretary of State after Truman is elected in 48. Atchison becomes Secretary of State, begins to marginalize. Um, Kennan Atchison is a passionate supporter of uh, uh, NATO. The idea behind NATO did not originate in the United States. It originated in Europe. The Brit British and French in particular were adamant that they could not follow the State Department's vision of integrating Europe economically and politically um, without American security guarantees because they wouldn't be self-sufficient anymore. The French in particular had to be dr dragged into this idea of European unification kicking and screaming. Um, they said, look, if you you make us go down this route. In five years' time, the Germans could cut off our coal supplies, or the Soviets will take over Western Europe and cut off our coal supplies. So if you want us to do this, and you're, you're, you're undermining our security, so you're going to be, have to be the ones res fundamentally responsible for it. Um, so it's uh, Ernest Bevan, the British Foreign Secretary, and uh, Georges Bidot, uh, the French Foreign Secretary in 47, who I think deserve the most credit. For credit this, for NATO. So, so when we think about the three Ds, the three Ds of development, diplomacy, and defense, which seems like a new thing in, since post 9-11, it's not new at all. It's been there at least since, since, since the Marshall Plan. A a absolutely, but as you emphasized earlier, the Marshall Plan was a, a genuine innovation in American foreign policy. You know, we talk, 
you know, as, a, as scholars and academics yeah, today yeah. about George Washington's farewell uh, address. Alliances. But this, this wasn't a, a scholarly thing to them. In, within the State Department, and Truman himself, they actually referred to George Washington and ask themselves, are we doing the right What would George right Washington do? Well, yeah, what would George if Washington we were gonna, do? If we were gonna overthrow this, this great lodestar, we better have a good reason for doing it. And they came to the conclusion that the world was fundamentally different now and that the role of the United States in the world in its own interest had to change because if, if we repeated yeah. the um, uh, post-World War I yeah. experience, we were gonna have so third world. I have, I have three things I got to cover and then I'm going to open it up and you've been a very patient audience. So just talk about the sales job in the Congress and the sales job to the American people of selling this radical shift after 150 years of moving away from un getting out of unentangling and There's been alliances. nothing like it in American history. How many hearings were conducted? Uh, dozens and dozens. Okay, so and, if anyone's been on the, the hill. More in the House than the Senate. So if you've ever been on the hill, and you've ever seen, so a Congress will say, we're going to have a hearing. Maybe you'll have two hearings. So dozens of hearings on this. Dozens of hearings, not just administration okay. officials, but um, private, private individuals. Vandenberg in particular was adamant that any private notable who stuck his head above the parapet right. and claimed some, to know some what egg, we Some egghead at a think tank, right? Yeah, Saying exactly. they're available to if opine on If you were at this. CSIS shooting up your, your mouth, mouth about what the United States should do I or resemble not, that remark. He was going to subpoena you. Think about so that. Before you open your mouth, think, you, better, you, better, you better be willing to come before... And the, back it not up. Not just before come before the American people. And, and back it, it up. And back, back it up so, because Vandenberg knew that this was a big... Commitment, so, so, and it had to be a national endeavor. Okay, so the other thing is, so tell me about how many members of Congress visited Europe to see how dire the situation was. Hundreds, and the Truman administration was very concerned. They went in the, in the fall. They began going in September of 47. Richard Nixon went. Richard Nixon went. Uh, he went to Italy. Um, and so so just, just, just so everyone, for everyone's edification, how, much, how big is a congressional delegation today going anywhere? I'm four? Is it six? So we're talking 100, 100 members of Congress at least went on multiple delegations. Now, were they allowed to bring spouses? <laughs> no, no they, this was uh, not a junket, right? The, the, the most famous of these committees was the so-called Herder Committee, and there were, were, were um, uh, two, two, two rules. He said, uh, no evening clothes and no wives. These were different times. Different times, yeah. quickly, <laughs> let me just quickly, quickly clarify. But, he wanted to make clear to them that no, th this is a serious mission. We are going to f to go to Europe to find out what the, what heck's the real really going situation on. is about and what these people actually need. So, so this is just a very different. Just so, just if you've ever been in the business of going to the Congress, getting a hearing done is hard. Think about dozens. Getting a congressional delegation to do anything, like getting four members of Congress, is a lot today. A hundred members of Congress, more than a hundred. So just for a minute, my friend George Ingrams here is one of the founders of the U.S. Global Leadership Campaign, which is an important voice for bringing a broader coalition of American stakeholders to understand the importance of being internationally involved in the world through our soft power. So just talk about, there was a forerunner to what George and others put together in the 90s about selling the Marshall Plan. Who, what was this? There was this group of notables that was put together I forget what it's called, but just spend a minute on that because I think it it's important a, too. I'm trying to remember. It was what like it was the, the Marshall the, Committee. The Marshall, the the Marshall Committee, but it was basically every every blue chip CEO in the country, every the presidents of universities, Labor the presidents groups, of universities, everybody. Group, religious groups. It um, uh, um, uh, was uh, absolutely remarkable. It was it was broadly called the Marshall Plan to sell the Marshall Plan. Um, and I, I have to emphasize that um, building public support was critical for this. And you, you actually had a number of really important um, groups in American society that were converted by the Marshall Plan. Um, uh, American business lobbying groups um, before World War II US were Chamber. fundamentally mercantilist and protectionist. Um, and this changed dramatically with the Marshall Plan. And one of, one of the things I found fascinating uh, in researching this book is that it, in the Soviet propaganda and the Western revisionist propaganda, this was all about dumping American goods on Europe. Absolutely untrue. 
Um, the Truman administration made absolutely clear to uh, 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 American business that this was not going to be a way to dump their surplus on Europe. Quite the opposite, that we had to rebalance the global economy. And one of the fundamental aims of the Marshall Plan was to cease um, being the primary capital goods supporter of, uh, for, for, for Europe, um, exporting our capital goods to, to Europe for which Europe could not pay, and to put Germany back into that traditional role, in, again, in order to rebalance the, the global economy. So we actually sacrificed our own mm. export interest, at least yeah. in the short run, in order to rebalance. To make it work. To, to, in order to, to, to make it work. This was also a 180 okay. on our German occupation policy. So I got, I've got two other things I just need to cover with you. So one is my friend John Sambrello is here, and John was had a wonderful career at AID. He, had a, one, he was a, a real leader at the Pan American Development Foundation, and it turned into a real force for good in, in the Western Hemisphere. But John has a, has, is, is sort of an uber hobby. Uh, it's beyond a hobby, and I'm hoping he's going to publish a book about the history of American assistance in the world. And one of John's points that he would make, and I know at some point I'm giving the microphone, is the issue of that the United States tends to think of that we only kind of started helping people really around Lend-Lease, which you know, many, I think people in this audience will know what Lend-Lease is. But there's a whole history before that. Herbert Hoover in some ways made his name for himself after World War I doing sort of a mini Marshall Plan in Europe could you just talk a little bit about, was there any kind of lessons learned from sort of any pre-Lend-Lease stuff? And can you talk a little bit about that to the extent you, that you came across that? Yeah, well, with regard to Herbert Hoover, he was a supporter of the Marshall Plan, but he was somewhat of a, a skeptic on how we intended to spend the money. Herbert uh, Hoover was. Herbert Hoover. Um, he was very important in terms of uh, reversing uh, our policy towards Germany, the so-called Morgenthau Plan to deal So would you just spend a minute on what the heck the Morgenthau Plan is? Because it was a, thank God we didn't go down that road. Henry, so Mor well, we did initially, and it did enormous damage. Henry Morgenthau was FDR's um, uh, Treasury Secretary, um, but probably the closest thing to his Secretary of State, the Treasury wielded enormous power on foreign affairs at the time. And uh, Morgenthau's plan, which he came up with in 44, uh, which Churchill was initially uh, appalled by until he decided, hey, maybe Britain could benefit from this, um, was that we should basically turn Germany into a giant pasture land. Ter a, terrible, a terrible era that was thankfully and, uh, stopped. You and I had a um, uh, nice discussion before about Harry Dexter White, who was generally an obliquitous individual. But even Harry Dexter White, who's been blamed for the Morgenthau plan and did indeed write out the details, warned Morgenthau that this would lead to humanitarian disaster. So, so um, we're not going to have time. I just want to just spend a minute on Harry Dexter White, one awful, terrible person he was, <laughs> and what a traitor he was. He was an absolute traitor to the United States. He was a Soviet spy, and nobody knows about him. And then one of the reasons that people don't talk about the Bretton Woods and the formation of the Bretton Woods is because I think in some ways I think it's perceived as born in sin, because Harry Dexter White is the architect of the Bretton Woods institutions, was an, a provable Soviet spy who did a number of treacherous things to undermine American interests I know over a number of years, is that correct? Uh, he did. And you cover it in both of your books. One thing I do want, want to make clear in terms of um, you know, this part of the pre-Marshall plan is that often people try to sanit sanitize Morgenthau by saying, oh, it wasn't really his plan, it was Harry Dexter White. No, it was Henry Morgenthau's plan. He didn't write the details because he wasn't intelligent enough to write the details. Harry 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 Morgenthau was, was, uh, was, tech, was known broadly as a dope, yeah, right, but technically. There were, there but were people like um, uh, Herbert Hoover, enormously influential, General Lucius Clay, one of the heroes of this story, yeah. uh, the military governor in Germany, who fought to overturn this uh, policy and to, to make, stop the Morgenthau plan. To stop the Morgenthau plan, to have confidence in our own ideals in America that we could, yes, make uh, uh, Western Germany into a successful democratic capitalist nation, an ally of the United States. This was revolutionary. Morgenthau continued to fight it with, among others, Eleanor Roosevelt. After he uh, left government. Yes, after. He ran a campaign to stop, in essence, against the Marshall Plan. He demanded, a, even in 1947, to continue the quote unquote hard peace. Terrible. OK, so just so I think one of the things that you don't talk about in your book, but I infer in your book, is that we 
the United States for the first time could raise its sights and think about that it could use its soft power in enlightened self-interest. This was all done in enlightened self-interest. This, was this wasn't done necessarily out of the goodness of our hearts. It was, it was, some of it was about the goodness of our hearts, but it was also about hard interests. That we, if we did this right in Germany and we did this right in Western Europe, that there was the potential we could, we could, we could transform the world. It, it wasn't. It, it wasn't as if we suddenly became magnanimous in 1947. In fact, if you add up all the foreign aid we provided from 1945 to 1947, it actually su uh, exceeded what we gave in, in the, the Marshall, Marshall Plan. Plan. But we we did it um, multilaterally, mainly through UNRWA, um, UN Relief and Reconstruction, uh, my God, so many one of those, acronyms. One of those alphabet yeah, suits. Um, uh, we, we contributed 75% of the funding for it, but we didn't have control over where the resources went, and that was considered to be um, overwhelmingly on both sides okay. of the aisle to be a terrible, terrible um, failure. So the idea behind the Marshall Plan is this time okay. we had to have control of So just money. last question, did the Marshall Plan work? The Marshall Plan um, uh, did work but uh, not for the reasons that, for example, many Keynesian economists in the State Department at the time thought it should work. Uh, economists have run statistical regressions to try to find out what the Keynesian miracle behind the, the Marshall Aid was. Was it that it, it helped Europe to Im import more? Well, yes, it did, but doesn't explain more than a small fraction of the um, uh, huge increase in output over the Marshall years. Was it that it allowed uh, more government spending? No, government spending as a percentage of GDP actually declined during the Marshall years, so what was it? Um, first, um, Kennan was right. There was a critical psychological el element. The m money was deliberately spread over four years. We were telling the Europeans we're not going home this time. We're not repeating the World War I um, uh, experience. Um, and, uh, which was important, but not enough. As I uh, emphasized, the security component was um, absolutely It, it wasn't going to be enough essential. just to have foreign assistance, that we were going to have to provide security guarantees that they were going to work together and, and we're going to rebuild of, Germany. One of the reasons was that the, the, the second element of the Marshall Plan that I think was um, enormously successful, we, we don't get enough credit for it, for it was the way we revived Western Germany, which was brilliant. I probably don't have time right now to go into all the details about how we did it. Um, That's but, why you got to buy his book, Retail. <laughs> but the idea wa was um, uh, that if we were going to make Western Germany into the fulcrum of the Marshall Plan, then we had to address French and British security concerns. So that's where that That's where the invention comes of NATO from. comes from. Okay, you all have been a patient audience. I want to get as many comments as possible. George Ingram, my friend Mr. Unger, uh, and my, my friends from Team Italy over here. You, you, let me start with the gentleman over here, please. Microphone, say name, just because just it's our, our European friends, since I suspect they had, they had some more skin in the game than, than we did. So, uh, Moreno Bertoldi from the delegation of the European Union. Um, ben, I've read only one third of your book so far, I'm continuing, <laughs> and, the, and so I'm at the tripartite conference that takes place uh, in uh, uh, Paris uh, between Molotov, Bidot, and Bevin. Um, so at that point, the Marshall Plan has been formulated in, let's say, in, in its general lines, but uh, is still uh, uh, unclear who will uh, be in, and so there is the discussion after whether the, um, uh, the countries, Czechoslovakia uh, and the other, that are, uh, the eastern part of the Iron Curtain. Uh, Spain uh, too, men. there was a uh, debate about whether Spain yeah. could. Spain um, ultimately did not get in, which is a whole conversation I'd love to have. Yeah. But. So the issue is whether, I mean, the, and the, you, uh, explain very well in the book that I mean the the, uh, the U.S. was hoping that uh, in reality Stalin would not buy into the plan and therefore the, uh, uh, the we we wouldn't the, get the blamed other, the Russians yes, would get blamed yeah and the blame would would go to the Russian but uh, um, what would have happened if countries like Czechoslovakia would have said yes and I ask that because I mean the uh, in the uh, in the part of the book that I've read so far I mean there the, the is the uh, Truman Doctrine in, uh, in March uh, 1947, and after that is the uh, 
Marshall speech in June and the, uh, uh, the tripartite conference in, uh, uh, in Paris, but you don't mention that in 1947 in May, the two communist party in Western Europe uh, are kicked out of government. I did, I did, you I did, did. of course yeah. I did. In the, in the I okay. uh, maybe it comes okay. later, so but the, the issue so, is the so following so the one. Question the is the, the question, question is the following. So let's say the Czechoslovakia had agreed to go to the Marshall Plan, that, and, they, and there was a strong uh, communist component in the government. Uh, would have uh, the United States be ready to provide uh, aid the to the Czech government? Or, I mean, the. the uh, Other satellite they pressure states. like it happened for So, so Dr. Zill, let me, let's capture three or four comments. Let this gentleman here also, and then we're going to get to uh, Mr. Unger and, and my friend George Unger. Please, sir. Everyone gets extra credit for shorter comments and questions, by the way. My name is Carmen America. I'm Italian. I'm from the Center for American Studies of Rome. Just yesterday, we, have an, we had an important celebration about the Marshall Plan in Rome. Uh, we had the participation of the of family of uh, Alcide de Gasperi and uh, the, the, all the story about the travel to Washington DC to sign for the, the Marshall Plan. Now, a distance of years, I would like to know from the American side, what is the level of satisfaction in bilateral relationships with Italy about the Marshall Plan? Did it work? How it worked? And what was the relationship with the, one of the most important communist parties in Italy? What is the effectiveness of the Marshall Plan in this political complex environment? Okay, Thank let's you. hear from Mr. Unger and then from George. And can we get some gender balance in the next round, please? So I don't want to ask, call on all dudes next, please. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Mike Unger. Um, just recently retired professor from Loyola University and a new fellow at here at CSIS. Uh, one comment, one question. Uh, professor of Monetary Economics, I could not put Bretton Woods down. I, that, for me, that was like a, reading a John Grissom novel. It just... Uh, His book. Uh, yes. Bretton this is Woods. my age. Yeah, I know. This is your, yeah, exactly. yeah. You're getting a cut. <laughs> right. it, it was it's a, a fabulous book. A barn burner. I, I, I love okay. that book, and I've sold many copies of that for okay. you. Okay. Secondly, uh, whenever we have a crisis today, it seems like someone says, ah, the solution is a Marshall Plan. We need a Marshall Plan. Obviously, uh, as the Soviet Union came in glued, we, we need, need a Marshall a, Plan. The German, one of the German ministries has a, a Marshall Plan for Africa, one of that, the ministers. That's what I was just right? going to say. We want a Marshall Plan for Africa. We need a Marshall Plan for the inner cities. Um, in the U.S.? Yeah, yes. What are your comments when you hear? What are your thoughts? What's your reaction to that? Yes. Okay, Thank George, you. George Ingram. First of all, thank you very much for an excellent read and filling in a nice piece of history. Um, also, thank you because uh, I spend time, because of my mother's from Cleveland, Mississippi, yeah. for giving due attention and credit to the unveiling of the, uh, the preview of the Marshall Plan by Atchison at Delta State. That's true. It's a wonderful, there's a wonderful scene about that. That's um, right. And Dan, you're right. The chapter on selling it to America, American people sounded very familiar. Sounds very familiar. I have a suggestion and a question. And my suggestion picks up on your comment. And that is, there's an article to be written on how the Marshall Plan is relevant and is not relevant to the problems we face today. Because every couple of years, one of our political leaders says, we need a Marshall Plan. Right. For Afghanistan or and Africa. And they have no idea what cities. the Marshall Plan is. So please write right. that article sooner rather than later. And my question follows on to Dan's last question. And that is, for me, what's missing from the book is here are the three or here are the six critical elements of the Marshall Plan and which ones were most important. You present the psychological impact. You give more attention to the important, the public diplomacy aspect, which I hadn't seen before. Um, you don't give us a sense as to how important the commodity shipments were to feeding people and getting factories started. And you don't talk about what I've seen elsewhere, the importance of the people to people, industry to industry, American businessmen going in back to Europe. So, if you can okay. give us those buckets and, and what okay. was most important. So, so let's just, so one question is, if uh, Czechoslovakia, would Czechoslovakia, Italy, Italy 
Marshall, Marshall, plans. Marshall plans every other yeah. year <laughs> and George Ingram's uh, question. So if you could do a minute on each one, because I'd like to do another okay. round. Um, Czechoslovakia. Um, so the, the um, Czechs continued, um, the Democrats continued to flirt with the Marshall Plan into the fall. Um, Jan Masarek, the um, foreign minister, um, said in a newspaper article that um, he still regretted that Czechoslovakia was unable to participate. The um, uh, communists began to get very nervous about his comments and the comments of other Democrats in the, the um, uh, coalition because elections were coming up in 1948 and they were, the communists were concerned they were going to get wiped out. So they went to Stalin and said, you got to do something. You know, send in the troops. Um, and Stalin refused to, sh to show his hand. Um, he didn't want to be blamed for what was going to happen in Czechoslovakia, but he sent his agent there um, who told the communists, um, enough with this, uh, with this um, democracy stuff, enough with this constitution, you, you have to seize power. And I won't go into the details about how the communists orchestrated the, the coup, but they did. And the State Department reaction was what I would call froideur. Um, basically, they were very realist about this. We did not have, we never had the military resources to protect um, Czechoslovakia. Maybe that's unfortunate, but um, um, they kind of did a, a little bit of historical revisionism. Um, saying, well, the, the, you know, the Czechs n never really were a part of the West. They were always part of the um, uh, Soviet sphere, so there's nothing we could have done for them anyway. So we basically um, wrote them off. I've just written an article called Who Lost Czechoslovakia, which I hope to publish that shortly that. to explain that. It's a fascinating story. It, uh, yeah. It's an important part Italy. of the book. Italy. Um, of course, the, the communists are kicked out of the coalition government in May 47. De Gasperi um, determined to keep the communists out, but constantly reminds the uh, uh, State Department that um, uh, if, you, if you want us to keep, keep, keep them out, you have to let us do things our way. And one you know, really fascinating part about the um, uh, conditionality of, of martial aid, which I do talk a, a lot about in, in, in the book, is that it didn't work with regard to Italy or, or, um, um, or, or France. Um, the Italians and the French went in diametrically opposed directions with their martial aid. The Italians, we badgered them continuously to have an industrial modernization policy, an Italian uh, Monet plan, and the Italians were staunch neoliberals led by Luigi Einaudi who said, you know, enough of this Keynesian nonsense. We're going to thank you for the aid. We're going to use it to, to stabilize our finances and our monetary policy. We're going to rely on, on private investment. And no matter how much the Americans threatened to cut off aid, the Italians knew that the only thing the Americans cared about was keeping the communists out of government. So they wound up pursuing their own policy. They had success in their, their own way. Um, and, um, we, you know, by the, by the we had already been through many fights when we arrived at the Korean War, and then everything changed. Uh, then everything, the, the focus was entirely external in keeping Stalin from doing the same things in Europe that he was doing now in, in, in Asia. Um, Marshall Plan every other day. Uh, Marshall Plan uh, every other day. Um, uh, one of the most remarkable legacies in the Marshall Plan is the enduring desire to repeat it. In the past five years alone, there have been impassioned calls for Marshall Plans in Ukraine, in Greece, in Southern Europe, in North Africa, in Gaza, most recently in, in Syria. It's never been imitated, um, uh, even, even badly. Um, and there are, there are reasons for that. Um, and um, um, uh, what, what I uh, emphasize in the book is, is how critical the security element is. Consider Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, we have already, the United States alone, have spent over $200 billion in reconstruction aid alone in Iraq and Afghanistan. That's over 50% more than the totality of martial aid in current dollars. So it's not as if we haven't tried reconstruction. What's missing there? There's a lot. I don't mean to oversimplify it. But the fundamental base is missing, internal and external security. I mean, both those regimes have had to deal with internal and external threats constantly. And you can never 
have, in my view, you will never have economic reconstruction, or in the case of Iraq and Af uh, Afghanistan, construction in the first place, just building the competent um, nonpartisan bureaucracy to implement these uh, reforms without security. So security is critical. Um, the, the, the last question, there are so many elements of it that I could um, take up. I, I, I don't even um, uh, know where to start. I mean, I, I, which, which, can I ask you which element do you think was most lacking in my explanation? Well, as I mentioned, other people have written about and talked about the importance of the people people change. There, there was, you're, you're, the, that might, that might be, be fair. Uh, for example, um, uh, European um, CEOs, and, and, and business managers were, were flown over to the United States um, to witness how um, uh, American businesses were run and how American factories uh, were run. I was at an event yesterday with the um, Dutch ambassador. Uh, For, on the anniversary of the On the anniversary at the US uh, Diplomacy Center. One of the things he talked about was how the um, uh, creator of, of Heineken um, had spent time in the U.S. studying uh, American industrial management and how he brought that back to the, um, uh, his country and, and used it to, to grow his business. So you're absolutely right that this was... Did you give more credit to the psychological impact than to the actual commodities that were shipped? Uh, no, I think the commodities were, were, were critical, but not in... Again, the econ economists who have run the statistical regressions were looking for sort of these Keynesian miracle explanations that weren't really there. They were critical social stabilizers. I mean, the Netherlands, people were starving to death. So when these ships started coming over with, with commodities, it not only fed them and kept them alive, but it make them, made them believe that there was, a, there was a power that was going to support them as they tried to reconstruct themselves, which I think was, was vital. I've got time for a couple more comments. I'm just wondering if, if anyone who remembers the Marshall Plan, is there anyone here who was around for that, could want, want to say anything? Because I'd welcome, so this gentleman, this gentleman, and come on, can I have a lady? Could I have a, a, fe and a female? Okay, the, these two gentlemen and this woman back here, please. Yes, sir. I remember the Marshall oh, Your name and who you are. Okay. I remember the Marshall Plan as a first grader. <laughs> we had little buckets in school in Germany, in Bremen, Germany, and had lunch feeding until about 1950. So, but I have a question. Stalin realized his mistake, right, in 1952, when he proposed the note on Germany, and he said that Germany can be reunified right. in 1952, provided right. West Germany leaves NATO and East Germany leaves the Warsaw Pact. Right. Was that his recognition of the success of the Marshall Plan? And he tried to undo it well, by neutralizing Germany? I, I, sh I should emphasize, Stalin always believed more than we did in the United States in the ultimate success of the Marshall Plan. That's why he committed so, so, so much, much prestige time, and diplomatic energy resources energy to, to, stop to, it. to undermine it. He really believed that the Marshall Plan was going to, 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 to work. So this was nothing new from, from Stalin. Stalin had for many, many years been dedicated to the proposition. He was the champion of reunifying Germany. He was the champion of the, the German people. Of course, this was entirely self-interested. His ultimate plan was to communize um, Western Germany. He made that clear that all of Germany must be ours, Soviet. He, said that um, uh, man, many times. So Stalin absolutely believed um, uh, in the Marshall Plan. Yeah. Um, and um, you know, I, I, there, there is some legitimacy uh, in, t of, in terms of S Stalin's views of the Marshall Plan in, from a security perspective. Germany was the mortal enemy. And once he understood that the Americans planned to create their own democratic capitalist Western Germany and rearm them, which they did, you know, Germany becomes a member of NATO in 1955, that was to, to the Soviet Union a fundamental security threat. So he was determined to do everything possible to, to stop it. And once we'd gone down that route, to reverse it. 
So let's get these, this gentleman here and this woman here, and then Dr. Steele, you could respond to both the comments and questions. Well, I couldn't resist that invitation. My name is James Lowenstein, and I began my Foreign Service career at the Marshall Plan in Paris in 1950. So uh, I'm about halfway through your book, Dr. Steele. It's a wonderful read. It brings back a lot of memories. Uh, three comments on the Marshall Plan. Uh, first of all, when I arrived there at the age of 22, I was struck by the atmosphere at European Marshall Plan headquarters. Everybody was working very hard. Some of the most eminent economists in the United States were all stuffed into little cubby holes in the Hotel Talleyrand in Paris. And in the course of a subsequent 30-year Foreign Service career, I never saw an atmosphere that was as positive and work-oriented as I did uh, then. Secondly, one of the things that has always intrigued me about the Marshall Plan is how little people know about it uh, uh, with respect to a couple of very critical things. If you ask Americans how long the Marshall Plan lasted, most of them will say something like seven to 10 years. The answer, of course, is three and a half years. Uh, that makes it an even more amazing success when you think that in three and a half years, Europe was really revived. The second thing is how, clever, how cleverly uh, uh, conceived it was, this whole concept of providing the Europeans with dollar credits so that they could buy what they needed in the United States since none of them had any dollar credits left. And the second was this counterpart system in which uh, the European countries had to put put a, a dollar in their local currency, the equivalent of a dollar in their local currency for every grant they received. And that money really doubled the effect of Marshall Plan assistance. And that money had to be used for infrastructure projects in the uh, Marshall Plan countries with the approval of the Marshall Plan mission. So those were things, uh, it, most Americans think we gave the Europeans this large amount of money to spend. That's not the way it worked. Uh, and the counterpart system uh, involves some sacrifice on their parts as well. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. This woman here, please. Yes, um, my question is a little bit more medical. And I know that um, penicillin was starting to be mass produced in 1944. Um, with the Marshall Plan, we're talking about politics and economics, but um, there were I don't know, hundreds of thousands of wounded soldiers, uh, mm -hmm. young men recuperating, people who had lived for years with vitamin deficiencies. Um, how did we share our medical expertise in the Marshall Plan? And um, were, was Europe able to get penicillin uh, throughout every country in Europe by 19, through our Marshall Plan? Um, could you explain that? And as far as medical research, were they able to s revamp their medical research institutes? And I know polio was still a concern. Um, could you address yeah, my, that? My understanding is that um, uh, certainly medical uh, assistance was, was part of the uh, UNRWA aid that the United States um, uh, mainly uh, underwrote. We contrib contributed three quarters of it, but I'm not familiar with what medical component there may have been or was not in the, the Marshall Plan. I plead complete ignorance on that point. So do you want to just comment on what the gentleman said? Um, the um, counterpart funds were indeed a very clever mechanism to provide assistance while main maintaining market incentives. So for example, a French farmer who wanted a tractor um, didn't just come to the United States and say, can I have a tractor for Christmas, please? That's not how it worked. The French farmer actually bought a tractor, an American tractor, but he paid for it in French francs. And these French francs could then be used by the French government in conjunction, in cooperation with the United States that would have to uh, approve the, the spending for reconstruction or, or um, uh, other types of um, uh, uh, projects that were uh, supposed to re revive the entire okay. country economically. But to just go back to the Italian case where the Italians did what they want in spite of US objections, the French 
went in the other direction. The French, the, we, we, we were constantly badgering the French to um, uh, uh, put the priority on, on fiscal and monetary stabilization, where the French moved much more slowly in that direction than the Italians. The French were determined to pursue their Monet plan for um, industrial modernization, and the um, uh, um, uh, Marshall Plan uh, authorities in Paris were getting extremely annoyed with these successive French coalition governments that came and collapsed and <laughs> came and collapsed. Um, but the, the French never gave, gave in uh, on, on this because they understood that the Americans, again, only had one central priority, and that was to keep the communists out of the coalition. So the French and the Italians took American aid and went in, in diametrically opposed directions. And guess what? They both recovered. Um, so you could have it. You, we, you were there. I was not there. But I got the impression that the US authorities in, in Paris and Rome thought that their approach was the, the, the salvation of the countries that they were, 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 were working for at the time. But you know, looking back with hindsight from 2018, it was a, you know, a question about whether we would pave the road with concrete or asphalt. You could use either. One is probably a little better than the other, but if, um, uh, you know, if the government felt we really have to use asphalt because that's what the people want, fine. We need to end it here. Could I ask you, and please join me in thanking Dr. Steele for being with us today. That's great. Thank you. I'll, I'll follow up with you.